Hel Advanced Helicopter Training, a Division of Advanced Aeromarine Systems. Um, we're here today uh, with Ivan Kristoff, and he's with the International Vertical Access Network. And uh, we're going to start off with just a little introduction as to what happens with helicopters, how they function in this environment. Uh, just a brief, I'm going to give you, a, we're going to take a look at a uh, video that has uh, an example of what not to do and how things go wrong when you're doing a rescue with a, uh, rescuing a person. It's not in high rise like uh, Christoph does, but, uh, or Ivan does, but it is uh, a great example of how things can go wrong to start with. For example, like if something like a computer breaks? Like a computer breaks. <laughs> so once again, welcome to the uh, 2014 Dubai Heli Show. Now what's happening here, in this case, they're doing a rescue, pilot's been injured in an uh, airplane crash, they've gone in to pick him up, the, the line hanging underneath the, underneath the helicopter is too short. The pilot flying the helicopter is not experienced at this mission. The downwash, the turbulence from the rotor blades is causing this litter, what we call a litter kit, to spin. Okay. Now, if you pick up a litter kit on a longer line and accelerate beyond 45 knots, the downwash and turbulent air will not contact a litter kit, a litter system like this, and you will not get the rotation. But the pilot continues to fly slow and keep them in what is essentially a miniature tornado. Especially if he's integrating with a helicopter, he's going to be uh, working in close proximity to a helicopter, maybe flying or, or working under it, uh, being slung by the helicopter. But there's a, a lot of work that goes into it before you even see the aircraft arrive on a job. It looks relatively uh, straightforward because of all the work that's gone into it. And it's called congested area planning. I'm only going to skip through this because we're I'm not going to take up too much of Ivan's time with it, but he asked me if I would go over it, just so everybody got a picture of all the work that goes into 
uh, the preparation before a, uh, a steep angle rope descent or a uh, rescue with a helicopter can be done or if the hel helicopter is working in the vicinity. Uh, all this work has to be done. You can't work around high-rise buildings with helicopters without having a plan, without the city knowing about it, without protection to the general public. So, who cares? Okay, protecting our, uh, this is it for the U.S. generally, but every country has its own regulatory body and its own regulatory uh, uh, regulations to go by. So in this case, we're using the FAA in the U.S. as an example. Um, so the protecting of the Part 133, which is the certificate a company holds to be able to do these kind of uh, operations, okay, is the entire crews, it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that the environment is safe and the conditions are right and they're following the plan. Objective to determine the congested area plan, CAP, objective. So in this case, the objective is to make sure that the congested area plan uh, must meet all the regulations and regulatory uh, requirements. And in that plan, there has to be mapping. They have to take into consideration the temperature, density, altitude, which is uh, your altitude, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, this all factors in on a chart to give you give the pilot an idea of what uh, power settings he can use. The, the higher you go, the lower power you're going to be able to apply to this, uh, for this mission. Now in a lot of cases when we're lifting a person, we're not weight limited, but we still have to know what our winds are, what the turbulence is, and you can imagine working in a high-rise environment like downtown Dubai, there's a lot of turbulence. It's like working in the mountains. Those buildings act as a mechanical interference to the relative airflow and to the wind, and it can be a very turbulent place to work. So all this has to be taken into consideration with a congested area plan. So when we're doing lifting and heavy lift, where I worked at Ericsson Airframe, this is, was always something we were considering. Uh, every lift, you can be lifting very expensive equipment, and we have to have the, all these uh, conditions taken into consideration once again. Now, when we're out working with a power utility, it's not like a congested area plant. Uh, but we wind up in uh, bringing these uh, towers in and, and erecting towers in congested areas also. They run through the countryside and through the mountains and into the cities. So all this has to be done as lead work and in advance. Background. Okay, this PowerPoint kind of lays out everything. So, you know, you get the contractor, who is the team? Uh, you know, how, how, to assemble, how you assemble a team, you have to have a team in place, okay? Uh, these are definitions for the actual regulations in your own regulatory uh, body that, that you have to go to, that you have to address to get uh, permission in your country or in your district. You will want to know all those rules and regulations and abide by them, and they will have a guideline for you to be able to build a congested area plan. So here's a congested area. The nature of an area is defined by what exists on the surface, not the size of the area. Okay, the presence of non-participating public is the most important determination of congested. Helicopters, in contrast to airplanes, can safely operate over relatively small congested areas. So once you get into a high-rise environment, you can imagine car parking lots become the working zone to work out of, also the safety zone for us to be able to uh, to, uh, to fly into, to uh, execute our emergency into an emergency landing. So they're going to clear, all that has to be cleared out. Wires have to be taken down. There's a lot of work that goes into it before you start operating in a city. So once you start lifting people off buildings, and now when you're doing rescue work, we have these complications where you don't have a lot of time to do this. Uh, if you're doing a planned rescue job, you're going to have to go through all this. Or if you're not a rescue job, sorry, if you're doing a planned descent, it's got to do with uh, repair and operations uh, that are ongoing operations, you're going to have to have these plans. But these are all the things, that, what you're hearing right now, are all the things that are being dealt with in the minds of the pilots when they come in to do a rescue. All the same factors have to be considered. Where do we go if something goes wrong? What are the winds? What's the humidity? You know, how long can we stay up here? You know, what are, what's our fuel burn? So then we have an operational area that's laid out. We map all these areas. We have to present these maps with the plan. Okay, and you can be lifting all kinds of things. Air conditioning units, 
this is Las Vegas where we did a lift. Uh, we put the, uh, stair, the, 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 the stairs on top of the Rio Hotel. There's a big stair network up there. All that was slung into place. So these are what congested areas are. So once Ivan gets up here, you're going to be, he's going to be speaking about you know, working in a congested area all the time. These high-rise rescues, these high-rise uh, operations that he deals with, with there's rope, with rope access. It's, uh, it's pretty tricky stuff. There's a lot going on. So as you can see, we plan, plan, plan. But once again, in an emergency rescue, we have to act now, but we still have to try to take a lot of this into consideration. At this point, I'm going to hand this over to uh, Ivan. Now, Ivan's the uh, head of a high rise, the uh, high rise emergency response team, and uh, I think I'll hand everything over to him right now. Well, thank you, Robert. Uh, that was very nice. Uh, the, the expert used to be, by the way, the uh, Philippa Times uh, in the news paper. I am very proud to be with him because uh, he has only four years' experience in making and still alive. And I will tell you about my three years' experience in the rope parks since I was a kid. I started with caving. Then uh, my dream was to come to Toronto because he has the tallest building in the world. And for me, I'll uh, just keep on this picture to, show, to tell you the challenges of this. Like the, the, the antenna mask I will show on the CN Tower, the top current mirrors. Is they can in such a way that they can flap because of the wind. Uh, because for a pilot, it's one thing to be at that height, and you have the low um, um, ground reference to the surrounding areas. But everything happened in super high rise. Super high rise, would say over two, three hundred meters, uh, will be multiplied by three. So I'll move over to this presentation that uh, I have. And this is the, the, the interesting thing about the two different perspectives of the pilot who is above, like uh, Robert and me who is below him. So, uh, the, until the Sea Tower was built in 1976, actually it's the uh, 10th anniversary of the first work that was done on World Boxes this year, and it turns out that this is the low ride. The, the high ride is typically 100 meters. By the Ministry of Revenue in Toronto, we can work on Boston Chair, you cannot work on just rope axes like that, rather than the incremental ropes. You can, you're allowed to work on rope axes on Boston Chair only until 95 uh, feet or meters, 200 feet. And if you're even one feet uh, higher, they can charge up to $15,000 a fine for that. So, um, for 35 years, it was do 1976. Uh, Nobody has ever been up there on the antenna mass, which is the 100 uh, meter top, the white top of the tallest building in the world. That was before Bushley, of course. And uh, even the people who constructed uh, the building, uh, there are so many unknowns. For example, one thing about the wind is that you can only predict, you don't see the direction. That's why the experience that Robert has gives him this, uh, the things that he learned just with the books. Uh, it turned out I was wrong. Uh, well, it was a privilege to be uh, the first guy because you can't compete with uh, tough uh, countries. It was a one time the first element because uh, some of the most advanced countries they have the best technology. It's not just about technology, it's about the person. Because most accidents can happen due to the human error attitude. Uh, because in the books you can get the right equipment, but it happens in uh, the second factors. So, um, one thing I learned there, and I was told, Ivan, whatever you do on the ground, you have to multiply it by three. And what turns out, for example, before I go to work, I, I see the uh, weather cap, the forecast for the uh, weather, for the wind speed, which is on the internet. But then they give me what's the wind speed the direction from the roof of the um, CN Tower. The other thing is that all the work, even the times I spent one week work, we had multiply by three, turn out to be three week, eight hours a day work because you, um, the week, even the wind speed, because all here stops, you get a lot of turbulence, but there you have just the front, the direction of the front. That's one thing. Um, 
the other thing is that um, you saw it over secure, not just the main lines, but to the left and right. So if you want to move, move into the left, you have to release one meter to the left and fix you up in the back. And the other thing is that uh, this um, the, uh, psychological element is the power of the abyss element. Some of the, that's why some suicide efforts, uh, people miss suicide, uh, before they jump, they, they, it's like a dream by the heights. It's like, uh, that's, uh, some of the problems that in space, First known uh, by the Russian cosmonauts, the, the guy comes out of the spacecraft, he just felt like he didn't want to come back. And it was interesting because you learn so many things that um, you have, you, you're taught, you learn uh, later. I was getting dizzy. I said, wait a minute, I'm a skydiver, I'm a diver, you know, I'm never getting dizzy. So oh, I don't, lift up your leg, you want to do it? You fall down right away. So that's uh, one of the things. Uh, the other is uh, that the iPhone system was too realistic, um, and that's made because it turned out that there's an airport nearby, so all the airplanes, helicopter, were flying below me. So imagine that's my outdoor office there, they're flying below me. And that's why it's decided that you know, um, the whole perspective of emergency response has been completely different than the triangle typical rescue do on a 100 uh, meter building. That's why I created this hard high-rise emergency area response team. And um, why did we need that? Well, you see, there were over 12,000 high-rise buildings in Ontario in 2003. Now they maybe uh, twice more. Uh, there was no emergency high-rise emergency crisis because of this uh, high-risk low-frequency event. Uh, and we were, of course, not trained for this specialized training. Uh, there, there was a lack of special trained rescue technicians at that high because as I said, uh, so many years nobody was allowed to work there. You had to go through, it's not just the rope access, it's uh, about knowing how to deal with you know, dangerous environment, uh, uh, microwave uh, uh, exposure, and how you find out if you're exposed, well, your, let me say your balls boil, then your brain, your blood, and that's why in some areas you have only a few seconds to survive. There are designated areas that says you have around 30 seconds to survive. That's why for the police, the emergency task force uh, is not worth the risk because of this high risk low frequency event. It's the high, high cost, they say, I don't know. Uh, what that, that means is that um, we, we cannot allow to start training one guy because if you have to train one fire station, we have to train all of them. That means that our insurance rates, the crime will go up for everybody. And what, something that happens once a year, maybe once in five, ten years, but this uh, accident did happen, and it proved that uh, there that's a solution. And the training for this high-risk emergency response team will come up with a high rescue, vertical rescue, air rescue, because when it comes to rescue, it's not just what you know, but it's about uh, what well, the pilot knows, so it's just not up to you. Uh, you. You come with so many outside sources, and that's why it's important that even on a presentation like that, we have a different uh, perspective. Thank you. For example, that was what I mentioned in terms of the, uh, the antenna mask. Now, another so we we'll see two per perspectives. This one has 10 balls, so it's supposed to move to this less resistant. Um, in that case, we have like a couple of meters uh, of uh, 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 moving predicted uh, the spirit of the tower and for the pilot, the robot, uh, there's not a low rise or high rise reference point because uh, here, if he can say he wants to move a few meters, he moves it, he sits where is it, here, that means a few millimeters. So it's more difficult. That's why it has to be this bond and that's why for specialized training, it has to work both ways, of course, the police, the fire department, they're aware of your emergency plan, so there is no element of surprise. Uh, some of the objectives, I'll go very quickly, is that uh, uh, the primary emergency response rescue to be uh, based on that experience in high rise contusion, but everything to be checked with the other guys we do because a system is as strong as is in a safe as its weakest point. We can be the best Spider Man. Actually, by the way, they don't want Spider Man there because they say, you know, we don't care because what if there is a um, Dust if you fall your liability. Especially, uh, this is a very high uh, 
liability because the, uh, the last thing you can have is the guy get tangled. Because you know what happens in a helicopter? Uh, it, it doesn't work. So that's why um, there's specialized training. There's so many rules that has to be any every element has to be double checked. That's why a rescue team they have to work out. So if the one um, has been too busy with doing something, the other checks with him, and it's a uh, it's a whole project working all together. Um, here's some. Uh, that's why. Uh, for me, at the emergency spot, I had to do my planning, but it was just based on my uh, my expertise. Then we, I did the concept of team two emergency airmen, because for the helicopter that we used the A355, uh, which is a twin engine, it was just a pilot and me, so it was very easy to operate. But helicopters like Mi-17, you have a whole a team of at least three, five, six people because you have the second pilot, you have the boarding engineer, you have the spotter. So it's a work, uh, and, and plus if you have, you have the element of uh, working in a hazardous uh, surrounding, confined space. Um, here's just for an example of how we, um, for one helicopter, we had different uh, external hoist systems. One was like using multiply uh, anchor points uh, and just go out. The other one would be underneath. Of course, um, it's needless to say that we have a backup and scenarios that if the pilot gets in a situation, for example, if I get, uh, we train so extremely, the, the mayor said no last one, he was driving, his, his limousine, and I had to go from the air through, uh, um, through the hatch. Actually, the driver said, oh, you know, I need your credit card, so thank you very much. But we did so precise, because that's why I want this specialized training, that's the combination between the pilot and the uh, rescue technician. Plus, I have this multi-level uh, training. I take advantage of the uh, whole system, when technology can help you. Uh, so we're looking into the vertical extraction of people, fire ops, and uh, via the aerial extraction uh, by helicopters, the diagonal, um, like a uh, trolley and tra traverse. And uh, that's why even the emergency truck was specialized with the equipment in mind communications with the with the pilot um, up to so much interest that um, I don't want to brag about me but in 2001 um, we chose one of the five uh, heroes with police, with ambulance and a doctor uh, for the Super Bowl is very important in America that's the, uh, uh, maybe like a horse ride tonight um, had to come uh, from the very top of the sky dome by the way, this is the place where two people had died because and they were experienced low access technicians and not because of uh, the equipment failure, it's about what was mentioned, the human element of the confidence. And uh, whatever we do, we have a drone spot, for example, my emergency vehicle is, has a GPS uh, communication system, exact, uh, which is monitored by the police. Uh, we have the, I have one in Canada, one in Bulgaria, that um, we have a camera phone up there and all the GPS information happens goes to the, to the mother base and the pilot can see that now uh, a lot of uh, allows him to see what's going there and plus you know, when I'm underneath I have this about the first remote display from the computer everybody, I, he can see from my eyes I can see what he sees vice versa technology allows us that and we take advantage we move to the training uh, even um, multidiscipline training, for example, we, uh, with the military, uh, because uh, that's MI-24. Um, um, uh, I had uh, training with the Cougar, because um, we had the winch cable, we had the, the hoist, the, the thick rope for the fast rope. Uh, um, it was very interesting when you meet me coming from the civilian uh, volunteer rescue uh, environment, uh, field of work, because you see, I don't make me, uh, money out of this, because that's where I spend my money, but I love so, flying and I've been allowed to have the privilege to be allowed to work with the air forces, with tactical units, uh, with uh, air police wings. Uh, it was very interesting, uh, all the things you learn from others' experience. For example, when I was repelling down the ropes, I was upside down. I like that. Maybe I made my trademark for that, there was two reasons. Well, first of all, I, I love, uh, 
uh, I like to swing, but then because you have this harness pathology effect, the, the harness, because of your weight, stops some of the most vital uh, circulation, uh, 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 blood circulation, and uh, it just kind of releases the tension. So I need that. And when I was coming down, uh, in really, uh, different ways, uh, we did the hot debriefing, but usually in uh, health operations, we have the hot debriefing, the first 15 minutes, okay, how it go, uh, was there something new, uh, something was not planned. Then you have the whole debriefing later on when things calm down and talk about it. And the guy said, well, why would, would you um, always upside down? Because you could be dangerous. Well, no, because I don't worry about my, my speed, my height. I know that I'm the king in my environment. But I was more concerned to see the reference to the pilot, how he's moving. Uh, I said, uh, because I'm, uh, I'm confident with me, but I cannot be as confident in the pilot. I said, well, I choose my uh, commander, he's uh, General Zwater, he's the commander of the base. Okay, uh, it was good, you see two different, completely different points of view. And that's how things work out. We always double check. Uh, what I say here, I'm very precious, we sit down with Robert, we talk, and I say, how do you should be about? Maybe he can have questions. Using technology to check all this, um, uh, it's very important to view tape it because then, in slow motion, if um, there's been an accident or is that you want to improve things, you can, you can review it. I've always tried to see solutions. For example, a few years ago, one of my friends has, uh, died because he saved uh, 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 a life uh, of the children. What happened is that there was a worse uh, whirlpool, the father and the children, and two children. He goes, he saved like, uh, uh, he saved the children. And he comes back to the father, but he was wrong. And the two guys, Bulgarians, um, were just like um, driven and, and they weren't found until three, uh, three days later, uh, their bodies, uh, the sea, rolled back. I said, you know what, let me see how a person can be self rescued. So what we did with a one single engine helicopter, because you can get an right? engine, and this is one of them, carriers. We, I showed even the government, even the Air Forces, you know, how things could have been done. And the point of this presentation is uh, exactly from this to, uh, to get your uh, experience and even learn from the mistakes of others. It's more intelligent than from your own. And being trained that uh, we can do anything in the air, whatever, is important. That's why uh, I've always counted on the permanent recording of this uh, uh, demonstration. You can remotely transfer images for monitoring, monitoring of emergency services. And that's how even on the ground or wherever, uh, the commander can see different points from, from the air. He can see the one from the situation on the ground. He can see from the uh, contact for what the pilot sees and see the, the worker because in that uh, demonstration we saw earlier from the top of the high-rise building, we put some smokers. So imagine uh, what happens is that our top skip is that if this is the high-rise, Here's a smoke because there's a fire. There's the pilot there. Well, because of downdraft, it would be like first. But through my eyes, where I'm lower, you can see what he needs and this is where I'm references. So it's just the GPS positioning. They're just different ways of uh, training. That's why here on the helicopter I had these nighting cameras. They can uh, film everything for, for different because that's what I mean. Imagine there's a smoke here. Well, here the downdraft there. At least you have this clear area. So uh, uh, we, we take advantage of this technology. And um, I would wrap up with that. And thank you very much for your presentation, guys. And for those who want to uh, come, uh, if you want, because you're the younger people, we're more happy outside to present to see the helicopter. We've all arranged how the demonstration will be done. And if you ask questions, if you want to take some photos, I will have this with you. We have arranged that for you guys. And we'll be glad to, uh, to move, have a coffee, and come in, I would say, a few... Uh, well, it's the quarter to uh, 12, so by 12 we are downstairs, all set up. So thank you very much for your attention, guys. Thanks. Thank you. And especially thank you, Robert, <laughs> to uh, 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 help us and give us some very valuable information. And I think I like the video, because by the way, I'm impressed with it. You know, when I saw in the news, I was thinking, okay, what can you do to thank you? Thank you. Thank you.
Any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Hey, good to see you. <laughs> you have a question, this gentleman over here. Okay, okay. 